All right. Lights, camera, action. Man, it's bright up here today. How's everybody doing this morning? That's right. It's about time. It took you guys like 10 weeks to actually be excited when I ask you how you're doing in the morning. So, And this is making me laugh every single week. This whole section right here in the middle, I don't know if you guys think I'm just going to dive bomb the crowd or what's going on. You can sit there. It's totally fine. A lot of you like the cheap seats, which is good. Hey, uh, my name is Michael Stahl. I'm the lead pastor here. If this is your very, very first time at Salt Church, I just want to say welcome. We're, I'm super glad you're here. I'm honored that you'd spend an hour with us this morning. Uh, hey, I'm really excited about today. We get to start our first sermon series where we're walking through a book of the Bible. Uh, so as you just saw in that one-minute intro video, we're starting this series called Centered. So if you, uh, if you have your Bible, today we're going to be in Colossians 1. But if you have one of these cool little things in your Bible, because Bibles are awesome, they come with bookmarks, uh, just throw that thing in Colossians, because we are going to be in Colossians for the next 12 weeks, not Easter, we'll talk about the resurrection, but the next 12 weeks will be in the book of Colossians. If you're like, dude, Colossians has four chapters, it's going to take us 12 weeks, welcome to Salt Church, that's how we're going to roll. Um, so hey, I wanted to just mention one thing. Uh, one thing really quickly is our groups. Uh, so groups are kicking off here. Uh, wait, let me go back. Go back to groups. Here we go. Anyway, groups kick off on March 28th. Uh, so that's next Sunday, uh, or no, two Sundays from now. That week, our home groups start. I preached about this a little bit last week, but we have uh, this week and last week are the two weeks where you could sign up to get into a home group. Uh, so when you walk out, you'll see tables at the very, uh, in the lobby. There's, there's 10 groups, but one of them filled up this week, which is in Verado. If you just started coming here, you've led a group in the past, we need more groups in Verado. We have a ton of people from Verado that come to church here, uh, and our, our two Verado groups are completely full. But if you don't live in Verado, good for you. Um, you can still go sign up for a group. There's a ton of them in Surprise. If you live in like the Avondale area, there's a group out there. We also have a group that meets in Pebble Creek that's a specialty group that is actually ministers. I know it's very specific. It ministers to women whose husbands have Alzheimer's or dementia. So we just want to care for people in groups. If you didn't sign up last week, you can sign up this week. So go out there when service is all over. Uh, granted, I'm not up here for the next 45 minutes. We'll be good to go. So that's groups. Sign up. They're going to be awesome. Uh, so back to our series. Uh, so Centered. Uh, study through the book of Colossians. Colossians is one of my favorite books in Scripture. Colossians is a very interesting book because it really goes all over the place. So you'll get to see over the next 12 weeks, I'll get to preach about all kinds of awesome things. Uh, so one of the commentators that I read, his name's J.B. Lightfoot. He said this about, about Colossae, the, where Paul wrote this book. He said, Colossae was the least important church to which any epistle of St. Paul was addressed. Like of all the churches Paul wrote letters to, Colossae was the least important of all the churches. So you're probably sitting there like, well then, Michael, why are we studying it? Why is that the first book that we're walking through? It's because the book of Colossians is extremely applicable to us as believers today. So just some background on the book. There's a lot of controversy of when it was written, even who it was written by. I believe it was written by the Apostle Paul around the year 60 A.D., so a fun fact is an earthquake completely destroyed Colossae in what a lot of scholars think about 62. So this letter gets written, and it's written by Paul, and when Paul writes it, he's in prison in Rome. And Paul, if you know anything about him, he's in prison all the time. So he's writing this letter. This is considered one of the prison epistles. So in order to understand the book of Colossians, we have to do a little bit of background on understanding the context of where this book was written, and that's in Rome. So just to give you a little bit of a background on Rome, in case you're not a scholar, Rome is massive, okay? So at its peak, in its pinnacle, Rome was 3.1 million square miles. So some nerdy person decided to take like Rome and put it over the United States. So you could see it would stretch all the way up from like where Alaska is down to like Cuba and Cancun, where a lot of you have gone on vacation before, not me. Uh, but that's basically Rome overlaying the 3.1 million square miles of the Roman kingdom when this book is actually written. So it's bigger than the United States. 
We also know that Rome ruled the entire world for 1,500 years. Okay, that's a really, really long time. On 4th of July of this year, the United States turns 245 years old, and we think our country's old. Rome ruled over the entire world for 1,500 years. So what that happened is there was a massive, massive footprint left in society that we could still see today. Uh, one of those was the Roman roads. So the roads in, that were built all throughout Rome, very, very advanced road system. And if you do like a Google image search, there's a ton of images where these, these roads are still up there today. And it kind of made me laugh because if you come to this church, a lot of you are driving down like some of these roads like Bethany Home or Perryville or Camelback. They're constantly under construction, right? I drive a truck, and I'm just like bumping up and down with my groceries in the back. We got Romans built these roads that are still there today, like the city of Buckeye and Waddell could learn a few things. But the Roman roads were very advanced. Uh, this is like a subway map of how the Roman roads actually work. So you'll see on like the top left of the screen, that would be like England, and then the bottom right is about India. Uh, all these different roads were built to basically be all throughout Rome. You could travel through Rome. So why am I talking about this? It's because Colossae, where that big black arrow is, Colossae was a very important city. It was prominent for one thing. It just happened to be like on a crossway to get to two bigger cities, Ephesus and Sardis. So Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, and then Sardis, there was no book of Sardisians or whatever. Okay, uh, so that's where the Colossae was right on that route. So what does that mean? It means that it was on a massive travel route that most people went through, and that led to a belief that we would consider what's called syncretism, okay? So I know that's a big word, uh, but what syncretism is, is what happened in the, there was a blend of all kinds of different cultures. So sorry, I, I give a sports reference every single week. Uh, this is what I'll relate it to. I had season tickets to the Arizona Cardinals with my dad since I was like a little boy, okay? I'm a massive Arizona Cardinal fan. But it would never cease to amaze me every single Sunday afternoon when it's 125 degrees in Sun Devil Stadium, we're playing like the Carolina Panthers, and there's all kinds of people from North Carolina that decided to come to the Cardinals game. Now we play the Cowboys or the Raiders or, God forbid, the Seahawks. All their fans infiltrate our stadium. So what's Arizona? It's a transient city. That's so you go to a Diamondbacks game. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of Dodger fans in there. It's a transient city. That's exactly how Colossae was. There was all kinds of stuff going throughout Colossae. It led to syncretism, but not in a sports sense. It was more in a religious sense because of the Roman roads. So this church at Colossae was a young church. It wasn't a, more than a couple years old, and people in the church were most likely brand new converts to Christianity, and now all of a sudden they're being taught false teaching that you need something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to be filled or in order to be fulfilled. And there was widespread argument on what the false teaching actually was. And no commentator can really nail it down what it is. It's just the fact is it was a mix of all kinds of different thought patterns, religions, philosophies of the day. So practically how it worked out in that church is you could just be a member of the church and your next door neighbor practices some sort of like Jewish mysticism. Another uh, neighbor might be into angel worship. Another one of your neighbors might not believe anything. Another one of your neighbors might be hardcore Jewish and follow to like the letter of the law. There was all kinds of thoughts being passed to the believers at this church and it was starting to confuse them because it was false teaching. So Colossae as a city, while it wasn't really prominent, it was complex. There were a lot of religious, philosophical, and cultural movements that were constantly happening, and all those things were jostling for the attention of the believers in this church. So the, the point of the poisoning going on in the Colossian church is that these false teachers were telling the people that there's a certain level of fulfillment that they cannot get to just by worshiping Jesus Christ. So the main verse, the key verse in all four chapters of Colossians is Colossians 2, 6 and 7. It says, Therefore, as you receive Christ the Lord, so walk in him, 
rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So when Paul is in a Roman prison and he's made aware of all this, he then writes the letter of Colossians to be sent to the church at Colossae in order to confront the false teachers that what they're teaching is actually incorrect, but also to give the believers at the church practical handles on how to actually fend off the garbage beliefs that were infiltrating that church. So again, if you're in your Bibles, Colossians 1, we're going to start here in verse 1 this morning. Uh, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. So if you're new to church or you just happen to be unfamiliar with the Bible, uh, don't worry, this is a letter. So it's a typical, it's just like a letter that we would read today, except for the introductions at the very beginning. The author's at the very beginning, not like how we would write a letter now, where sincerely, Michael, or whatever. Paul is indicating at the very beginning of this letter who's writing the letter. And it's Paul, okay? Paul, bigwig in the church, started all these churches. It's not just some random guy writing this letter in prison. Paul identifies himself that I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, I'm a man with authority to speak to the church. I'm an apostle. And how does he have that authority? He has it by or through the will of God. That from the beginning of time, it was the will of God that Paul would be so ordained to speak to the church at Colossae. That Paul was ordained to carry out God's redemptive plan at this church from the beginning of time through the will of God, but it's not just Paul, it's Timothy as well. Timothy, who says, is his brother, or the church's brother. So this is one of six books that Paul wrote, where Paul writes it along with Timothy. So Timothy's probably hanging out next to him in prison. Uh, Some people even think Timothy actually wrote the book, and Paul just told him what to write. But Timothy is Paul's best friend. Timothy is Paul's travel companion. Uh, Timothy was Paul's, like, ride-or-die dude, okay? And who are they writing this letter to? Uh, They're writing it to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. So you see, Paul, he categorizes his audience as two things. He calls them saints, not like New Orleans saints, but he calls them saints. We were saints back in that day, not even like a Catholic saint. A saint, the Greek word is hagios. A saint was somebody who would be set apart. So a Christian would be called a saint. And also, these people are not just saints, but they're also faithful. So remember the syncretism that was creeping into the church. He's writing this to the people who are staying faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ, not the ones that are getting thrown off by the false teaching. But you also see how the audience defines themselves. They have two different labels. They are first and foremost in Christ. So you'll see that's a theme all throughout Paul's writing, union in Christ. And you see the term in Christ, it's over 40 different times in the letters of Paul. And it's meant to communicate that the fact that his audience are Christians and they're no longer bound by sin, so they're no longer in our first father, Adam. They're now in Christ. They consider themselves Christians. They're washed and clean in Christ. Not only are they in Christ, but they're in Colossae. So that's where they live. It's a church, and Paul's writing this letter to Christians. That is very important to always understand. In verse 3, It says, we, that's Paul and Timothy, always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So Paul had a Jewish background, uh, would have grown up like textbook Jew, uh, followed the letter of the law completely to where he persecuted Christians because they thought they were taken, he thought they were taken away. But he would have followed every letter of the law to where Paul would have prayed every morning, every lunchtime, and every evening. So when Paul says that he always thanks God, Paul's saying, like, I have a very healthy prayer life where regularly throughout the day, Paul is giving thanks to the Lord for this church. And that prayerful mindset led him to a mindset of thankfulness. He had thankfulness because he's probably sitting there in prison hearing of what's going on at this church, and he's thankful to God that these people are staying faithful to what God would have them for. 
Verse 4, he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. So we see this church in Colossae, they practice three main virtues of the Christian faith, right? They practice faith, they practice hope, and they practice love. The exact order is faith, love, and hope. And it's faith, but it's not just a blind faith. It's what? It's faith in Christ Jesus. It's actual faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's this vertical relationship with God. And that vertical relationship then leads to a horizontal love that Paul mentions. And it's not just a blind love that extends to people with no meaning. This love was for all the saints, all the fellow Christians, all the Christians who came passing by on that road through Colossae. That's who Paul's saying that they loved. Because of their vertical love for Christ, they were able to have love for the people in and around them, even the people who may have disagreed with them. And because of their faith in Christ, because of their love for one another, they're able to lay up hope for the future in heaven. So that term laid up is basically, it's the same Greek word that would be taught of like taking a coin and putting it in a piggy bank. Like setting it aside, knowing that one day you're going to get it, but right now you don't really have much access to it. So it's putting a coin away for safekeeping. It's laying up those things in heaven, which is what I want to talk about this morning. So where did they hear of this laying up of hope? They heard it through the gospel. They heard it through the gospel of Jesus Christ, what the word of truth, which verse 6 says, has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit." So now Paul shifts from the message, the gospel, to who the actual messenger is. And and the cat starts to get a little bit out of the bag that that Paul wasn't really the guy who planted this church at Colossae. A lot of people think that Paul never even walked through the city of Colossae, yet Paul's writing this letter. It's Epaphras that planted the church. But doesn't that make it amazing to think that like Paul just said, like I sit here every day and I pray for you. And I'm thankful for you. Paul is amazing because he thanks God for the people. He prays for the people he has no relationship with, nor has he ever even known. Paul cares about this church that was actually planted by somebody completely other than him. And as we see all throughout Paul's letters, he prays for, cares for, gives thanks for his people frequently. Paul's an awesome, awesome pastor. And that even extends to people he hasn't met. These people just happen to be a larger part of the scope of his ministry. So Paul, right away in the greeting of this letter, he's trying to bring to mind or remind the church of what their foundation is. And the foundation is what Epaphras clearly preached to them. It was a message of hope. And Paul's just trying to get across to the point to the people, like, no matter what you hear, you need to go back down on what this foundation is, which is hope. Remember verse 5, the hope that is laid up for them, the hope that's brought up to them in heaven. Think about it, like put yourself in the shoes of that Colossian church. It had challenges, and it's not like it was an established church. You know, I can relate to that. This church right here is 10 weeks old. The church at Colossae was relatively new, and there's all kinds of viewpoints coming into this church trying to thwart the the mission and message of Jesus Christ. And what you started to see is there were members of the church that started to listen to the noise around them. They started to believe those things around them. And the noise that you need other things in order to worship Jesus than just simply Jesus himself. So what we're going to see over the next three months is that this church has a ton of parallels to what our church has today. We shouldn't always read scripture like, what does this mean for me? We need to realize like, what does this mean for the people it was written to? But it is staggering to read through the book of Colossians and start to see the parallels between a church that was in 60 AD versus a church that's sitting here in 2021. So I want to remind you all this morning that just like Paul reminded them in the greeting of this letter, 
that you have already received the true word of God. Like this Bible that we hold, the 66 books of the Bible, is the true word of God. You do not need to look any further than this book in order to feel fulfilled or in order to feel full. So I'll just start with the Christians in this room. Like, we need to be spending our time more focused on what actually matters in this life. I think a lot of you would agree with me that you walk out of here at 11 o'clock or 11.30 or whatever time you leave here, noon, there's noise that starts to hit you in all kinds of different directions. Unless you just sit in your room all day with your phone off. You hear all kinds of different opinions on what we need to think. I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian, to set your mind on things that are actually things that are worthwhile. Uh, Later on in this book, we're going to encounter one of those cute verses that you get to put on a nice little sign in your house, right? Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. But I was reading this text and I started to think to myself, do we really, as Christians, do we really lay up our hope for the future? Do we treat our day more like it's a debit card or a savings account? Um, I say that to say this. We spend so much time immersing ourselves in things that won't mean anything in just a couple of years, let alone when we die. We waste our time with things that don't matter. We numb our minds with entertainment to just simply get us through the storm that is life. So this week's been an interesting week for me. There's been a lot going on, um, and and Wednesday was a really interesting day. So I'm trying to come into, like, rhythm of what it's like to be, like, a lead pastor. I've never done this before, Uh, so I'm trying to, like, figure out what my days look like in my weeks, because I work seven days a week, and I cannot do that. So I use Mondays and Wednesdays to just meet with people. If people want to meet with me, Monday and Wednesday is a good time to do it. So here's what happened to me on Wednesday, Okay. I woke up, and I am like the ultimate coffee snob. You just need to know that about me really quick. Um, I have a $700 espresso, not a Nespresso machine. Okay, that's cheating. I have an espresso machine in my house that I actually pull my own shots with every single morning. So every single morning, I make my wife either an Americano or a latte. Then I do myself, I do four shots of dark bean espresso over ice. Okay, Every single morning, without fail, that's exactly what I do. Dark beans, none of the weak, light stuff, okay? (laughs) Dark beans. And I know light beans have more caffeine. Don't come at me with that. So Wednesday, I wake up. It's like 6 in the morning. I have four shots of espresso. I then go to a meeting with somebody at 1.30 at Starbucks. I cannot drink, like, black coffee from Starbucks. It's disgusting. No offense if you like it. So I got vanilla sweet cream cold brew. Okay, that comes with like four more shots of espresso. Wednesday night, my wife and I go over to somebody's house for dinner. I have iced tea. Okay, so I'm like heavily, heavily, heavily caffeinated all day on Wednesday. So here's what happens. I go to bed just fine. It's like 1030, go to bed, laying in my bed. Uh, We've had a baby monitor in our room for now six years. Okay, and this baby monitor has gone off every night for six years. So without fail, my little baby girl, my little princess, Quinn, it is 1.30 in the morning and she just starts screaming, okay? So what ends up happening? My wife gets out of bed, okay, that's just how it works in my house. She goes and gets Quinn back to sleep, but then all my caffeine from that whole day on Wednesday starts to kick in. So what am I doing? It's like 2 in the morning and I'm laying there like wide awake in my bed. Thinking of like you all, thinking of all of this, my mind will go a mile a minute when I wake up. So now it's, I keep checking my phone. It's 2.15, it's 2.30, I'm not going to be able to go back to bed. And finally my wife like leans over, she's like, why are you on Twitter? I'm like, I can't sleep, I don't know what to do. And I said, I'm going to go downstairs and I'm just going to read. And she's like, at 2.30 in the morning? I was like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it'll put me back to sleep. I'll get like a theology book. I don't know what will end up happening. (laughs) So I go downstairs, and for the next three hours, I I read. I read from literally 2.30 in the morning to 5.30 in the morning. And you'll hear me say things all the time like, look for the things in your life that stir up your affection for Jesus. One of those things for me is like when I read. Uh, It doesn't even have to be like a Christian book. I just, for some reason, when I read, I feel close to the Lord. So for three hours that morning, I read. And it was really weird because I was obviously reading a a theological book. 
Um, and it just started to really like stir my affections for Christ on Thursday morning. And it started to happen all throughout the day. I started to notice like I'm dead tired. I've been up for like ever. I'm running on three hours of sleep. But what I started to see is that centering myself with the Lord in the very like middle of the night, basically, I started to have one of those days as a pastor where you get down to write your sermon and things are just coming to your mind. That things are coming to your mind on like who in your church needs prayer, who needs care, who do you need to connect with. All these different things where Thursday I was dead tired, but I felt like I was firing on all cylinders. Why? It's because for most of the day I was just reading, I was setting my mind on heavenly, th heavenly things. It's not, I was even so awesome at it that my wife left the house on Thursday, I was reading in the timeouts of Suns games, Okay. So I was like really killing it on Thursday. But here's my point. I love days like that, but days like that don't come very often. And I think a lot of you would agree with that. I think a lot of times, like, I get down, I'll write my sermon, I write a few things down, and then I'll check Twitter to see what's going on. You know, we get distracted. That's us as people. We get distracted by the millions of different things around us that can distract us. We pay attention to all the noise. Like, look around next time you're at a stoplight. You'll just be stopped and look at everybody. Most people, when they get to a stoplight, what do they do? They pull their phone out and check social media on their phone because we can't handle, like, a 30-second stoplight without seeing what's going on. We're distracted. Like, a lot of us can't stop. And what happens is that in the balance of our days, we end up spending 10 minutes, if we're lucky, with God. And then hours on end with the things of this world. We're really no different than the Colossian church. We're just 2,000 years down the road. The problem with the church today isn't that we're too passionately in love with heaven and seek heaven. It's that we're so drowned out by the noise of the world that we're scared that heaven might be a place that we're not actually going to like when we get there because it's not going to have all the comforts of this world. Like how off have we been as men and women of God? Uh, John Piper, uh, he once said, the problem is that professing Christians are spending 10 minutes reading scripture and then half their day making money and then the other half loving and repairing what they spend it on. Like how accurate is that quote? We work 80-hour work weeks so we could say that we're successful. We, we work a ton just so we can make money, even though the government writes us $8,000 checks every other week, which is a pretty sweet deal. There's all kinds of stuff going on around us. So when Paul's telling the Colossian church, hey, store up things in heaven. Like, use your faith in God as a savings account. Not like I approach God to see what he could give me right now. That you literally press yourself into the things of the Lord because you're laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. He's telling the Colossian church, you have to have a mindset of heaven. Like that has to be the case, and that has to be the case for us too. We need to remember that the most important thing we do in our day has to do with the inheritance that is laid up for us in heaven. 1 Peter 1 calls that inheritance something that's imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, it's kept in heaven, and it's being guarded by God's power through faith. So I know I'm like super type A personality, okay? I track the mileage of my truck on a spreadsheet. I'm not kidding. What does your day look like? Think about it. Like from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed, what does your day look like? Do you actually have some sort of plan before the day starts of when you'll actually spend time with the Lord? Do you actually take a step back and sometimes actually take each one of your thoughts captive like scripture tells us to? Do you take account of the things in your life that stir your affections for the Lord? Do you take account of the things in your life that put you in a bad mood, the things that trigger you? Do you slow down or is every day from the minute your feet hit the floor to the minute you get back into bed just like, I have no idea what just went on? As Christians, through all the noise that we hear of COVID, politics, like this church is making me wear a mask, like all these different things, like... We as Christians have to hold out hope that hope is already laid out for us. Like this is as bad as things are ever going to get on this earth. And that treasure and that hope is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is telling these people. 
Don't get thrown off by everything that's around you. Focus on the gospel. You know it. You've heard it. You follow it. Don't start to look at all these different syncretistic, I don't even know the right word, different things that, that could throw you off. Focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all we need. One of the coolest things about the book of Colossians is that Paul's writing to a church he never even set foot in. He's writing to a people that he doesn't even know. We see it's the guy who's done all the legwork is this guy, Epaphras, right? Epaphras is the church planter. And here's what's really cool. If you study scripture, if you go to Acts chapter 19, you see the Apostle Paul. In in a three-year period, he spent in the city of Ephesus, which was 120 miles away from Colossae. That was Paul's third missionary journey. And as we've already said, the town of Colossae wasn't very important, but the town of Ephesus was. That's why Paul spent three years there. It was a bustling city. It was a commercial center where everybody would go. And Acts 19.10 tells us that this, and that's Paul sharing the gospel in and around the synagogue, continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Now remember how big Rome is. Basically, from England to India, in two years, the gospel was spread to all the residents of Asia. Epaphras is one of those residents. Just think about that. So being from Colossae, Epaphras hears Paul is in Ephesus. He travels 120 miles to Ephesus. He hears the gospel from the apostle Paul. He believes in the gospel Because Paul actually preaches the good news of the gospel. And then Epaphras travels the other 120 miles back to his hometown. And he starts this church in Colossae. Now think of how much of like a boss the Apostle Paul is. Okay? Like the day somebody comes into this church, accepts Christ, and then we send that person out to plant their own church. I'm going to be walking with some swagger because we're very far away, away from that. But think about that. Think about the ministry of the Apostle Paul, because he did what? Everywhere he went, he shared the gospel. Without Epaphras hearing the gospel, there's 65 books in the Bible. There's not 66. There would have been no opposition for the gospel in the church at Colossae, because nobody would have planted that church. So we see again in verse 6 that the gospel, since the day the church heard it, was increasing. It was bearing fruit. It was increasing. The gospel, since the day that it went out, since the day that Christ resurrected from the grave, the gospel spread like wildfire. Because that's exactly how the gospel works. When the gospel's proclaimed, people believe in it. That's why we don't, at Salt Church, we don't try to get tricky. We just proclaim the gospel. We preach the gospel. We tell people what the good news of Jesus Christ is. Because that's what saves But just like Paul told Epaphras and then Epaphras told his hometown, like we have to audibly share the gospel. We have to audibly share the good news with our mouths to the people around us. Like we have to believe that we have the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you share the gospel, good things happen. People are rescued from hell. Like, just think about that. We have that charge as Christians to share the gospel. And we'll see all throughout this book that the gospel is enough. The gospel is all that we need. Through all the noise, it's crazy. This was completely brought into canon thousands of years ago. And this is all that we possibly need. We're going to see people in this book of Colossians turn to literally worship angels. We're going to see people deceived by others, telling them that they need to, to... Believe other things in addition to just Jesus in order to feel full? That's false teaching. That's false doctrine. Jesus is enough. If you came here today and you've just been searching for the meaning of life, I want to tell you that it's like it's right in front of you. It's Jesus Christ. You need nothing else. All these different things that we numb our minds and our bodies with, you need Jesus Christ. Nothing else that you can possibly spend your time with died on the cross for your sins. Jesus Christ did. But church, we have to be bold in relaying that message to the people around us. We have to have eyes to see the lost around us. We have to have a passion to proclaim who saved us. Like, be bold. 
I want to invite the band back up as we close, but I was reading this week about uh, just the explosion of Christianity in the country of China. Um, It's amazing that the tighter and tighter and tighter they make restrictions on the Christian church in China, the more Christians that happen to pop up. In the last decade, 14 million people of China, in China have professed faith in Jesus Christ. 14 million people, that's over a million people a year in 10 years. There's probably a lot more, uh, but they don't report it because they're afraid to get persecuted. In the last decade, the number of Christians in China has almost doubled. Pastors are getting arrested, Bibles are getting confiscated, Uh, the Chinese government goes out and they burn crosses and they damage church buildings. Uh, The country of China, like, censors our YouTube page. (laughs) We have 200 people at this church, why are you censoring my YouTube page? They don't want the gospel message to go to their people. They don't want their people to know what the truth is. Persecution's running rampant. But so is the message of Jesus Christ. So is the gospel. So if you as a Christian here in in Phoenix, Arizona, and you're looking around just a little bit because your preferences are getting pushed on a little bit, know that maybe God might be starting to do a good work in and through you. That the church constantly grows through persecution. The church grows when the gospel is spread. So church, we need to carry that message of hope. Sorry. Uh, we live in a world (laughs) we live in a world that desperately needs to hear it I mean just to be dead honest with you I could look I for the longest time when I planted this church I live in uh, one of those houses in Verado that you can jump on your neighbor's roof okay um and for a long time, I, I would take like this screenshot of my neighborhood, and there's 19 houses in my block. And I would always use the example, um, 80, 90, 95% of these houses don't get up to go to church on Sunday morning. Think about it. Like when you leave here, there's people all around you that are broken. Like I'm the pastor of this church. You should see my inbox and my email every week. People who are Christians that are broken, people that are Christians that are hurting, Like, we have to understand that, like, this book is the greatest message that can ever be given to anybody. If you walked in here this morning and you're just, like, at the end of your wits and and, and you've never believed any of this or anything like that, I need to tell you that, like, this is going to be the end of your looking. Just simply, like, putting your, placing your faith, placing your trust, placing your hope in Jesus Christ is the best decision that you will ever make. But as a church, like, we have to proclaim it. It can't just be my job to to sit up here and yap for 30 minutes a week. You have to be people who leave here, that you have eyes to see the broken, you have eyes to see the hurting around you, and you have to know that the message of the gospel, the message of Christ crucified, the message of Christ dying on the cross for our sins, all that wrath that we deserve, that Christ paid for that, that is the biggest message of hope that we could possibly tell people. So if you need prayer for anything this morning, uh, we're going to have people on both sides of the auditorium. Uh, I just want to encourage you, this church is serious about prayer, and not just throughout the week here. Uh, If you've never accepted Christ and you want to do that, now is a really good time. We'd love to pray for you. There's people on each side of the auditorium. If you have a need, if you're hurting, if you're broken, anything like that, like Scripture is very clear that we cast our cares upon the Lord because He cares for us. I want to encourage us as we leave to understand that there's a ton of noise around us. There's a ton of different things that, that the enemy is sending to distract us as people. Focus on the gospel. Focus on the gospel. That's the one thing that works. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Scripture. Lord, it's just such a beautiful thing that we can sit here and for the next 12 weeks dissect a letter that was written almost 2,000 years ago. That you've preserved that over time. Uh, that there's so many intelligent men and women have argued over what the false teaching was and all this different stuff going on in this book. God, I pray that at the end of this 12 weeks that we could just fall deeper and deeper in love with you each and every week. God, that as we leave here as men and women in such a consumeristic culture where we have anything we want at our fingertips of any given time of day, God, I pray that you stir our affections in a deep way for who you are. 
God, that our days don't look like just from the minute we wake up, we don't know what's going on, but Lord, we can spend time with you, not in a legalistic sense, Lord, but to just pursue you, that you can transform our hearts, you can transform our minds, you can continue to encourage us to walk in the fruits of the Spirit. God, I pray for anybody who walked in here this morning and is just struggling. Uh, God, I pray that they understand that, that you're right next to us. God, so many times in my life you've felt a million miles away, but Lord, the truth is you're right next to me. Uh, so God, this morning I pray that, that we just are excited for what the future is, that we don't look at the politics and things around us that might frustrate us, but instead, Lord, we can just be a people who know that we're about your business and we're about doing your work, God, and that we could be a people who are bold because we carry the message of hope in your Son, Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the men and women that show up here every single week. But God, I pray a special level of boldness that we could go out and proclaim exactly who you are to this city. It's in your beautiful name I pray. Amen.